When it comes to writers in the industry today, there are many who stand out. But if you were to ask me, when it comes to the very best at writing dialogue, nobody comes close to Quentin Tarantino. So what's the deal with Tarantino? Why is his dialogue just so hypnotising? Well, there are many reasons why, but I think a great place to start is the first scene of an indie film you might have heard of called Pulp Fiction. Forget it, it's too risky. That was it. The very first line of the movie, and he already has the viewer's attention. And the reason he's grabbed us is because he uses a very specific device, and it's a device that is not often talked about. In fact, it's talked about so little, it's a device that doesn't even have its own name. So because of that, it's something I've come to call the Pledge. Now, please bear in mind, this is just my own thinking. The Pledge is not some famous literary device, but just a little phrase I've coined to try and understand how to tell a good story. Simply put, a Pledge is a promise to the audience audience that at some point in the future, whether it be far off or immediate, something interesting will happen. And Tarantino is the master of the pledge. It's how he already has the viewer's attention within the first five words of the film. What he says... Forget it, it's too risky. The line is essentially saying that they are planning something, and what they're planning is very dangerous. Naturally, dangerous things are going to interest the viewer, so for the next few minutes, that pledge is stuck in the viewer's mind. What are they planning? Why is it so risky? The viewer doesn't know exactly what it is, but what they do know is that something dangerous is going to happen. All that investment created from only five words set. And of course, a pledge doesn't necessarily have to promise just conflict, or even conflict at all, because if conflict were the only thing that an audience would find interesting, then all movies and stories would be nothing short of one long argument or fight sequence. So to better understand the pledge, let's look at another way Tarantino uses the device. Let's look at The Hateful Eight. So here's the summary. Major Mark West, Sam Jackson's character, had a massive Confederate bounty on his head because he broke out of one of their most famous prisons. Did you bust out? Major Marquess did more than bust out. Major Marquess had a bright idea. So bright, you got to wonder why nobody never thought about it before. Tell John Ruth your bright idea. <laughs> you want to know what he says next, right? And the fact I just paused that clip at that moment almost annoyed you because you want to hear the story of how he broke out of prison and gained a bounty on his head. That's the whole point, and that is the pledge in action. It's one of the reasons Tarantino writes such great scenes because he often builds an anticipation towards the future, whether it be the next scene or simply the next line of dialogue. Not all, but many of his lines build a larger picture. They don't just serve themselves, but they also serve the next line, so the audience is kept in a perpetual state of wanting to know what happens next. And that's why it's just so hard to stop watching a Tarantino film, especially when there's an exchange of dialogue. In relation to the first line of Pulp Fiction, I can imagine you might ask, but that line of dialogue... Forget it, it's too risky. That isn't a pledge, that's a hook. And you'd be right, that line is a hook, just like a great line of prose at the start of a good book that grabs the reader's attention. But this line also serves the purpose of being the pledge for the scene. And then, you might ask, so aren't a hook and a pledge the exact same thing? Well, not really. A pledge is more fundamental to telling a good story, because a hook is cheap. It grabs the viewer's attention. A pledge maintains it. And I think what's worth noting about Tarantino and his scenes is how there is always conflict in them. Let's look at the start of The Hateful Aim. The first scene, the Major is held at gunpoint in a tense first encounter with another character. The second, they are having an argument on whether a bounty should be taken in dead or alive. The third, they have a tense encounter with another man where he claims to be the sheriff and they don't believe him. The fourth, the three characters have an argument about the civil war which ends with a gun pointed in someone's face. The next, they meet everyone in the haberdashery and they are all very suspicious of one another. With a few exceptions here and there, in Tarantino's films, every scene, Every conversation, every line of dialogue has some conflict attached to it. There is always something at stake in a Tarantino scene, whether it be something as simple as a character losing an argument about a foot rub to being discovered as a spy, or just being shot. Because there is always something at stake, there is always conflict, which is the core of any good story. When it comes to writing great dialogue, there is another quality that makes said dialogue interesting that many writers fail to capture, and it is something that Tarantino has proved time and time again that he is a master of, and that quality is subtext. 
and what is subtext. Quite simply, it's what is not said. It is the show-don't-tell rule applied to dialogue. It is the difference between the words that come out of a character's mouth and the thoughts that stay in his head. So, as a purely hypothetical example, let's say there is a German officer in World War II and he comes across three American soldiers who are trying to pass off as Italians. However, he knows full well that they are in fact spies. How would a bad writer write that scene? Well, it might go something like this. The Americans try to speak Italian, but miserably fail. The officer's face drops as he realises that they are lying, and then he tells them something along the lines of, I know you are spies, and you are screwed. So that isn't exactly terrible dialogue, but it could be made a lot more interesting, and what more, by a pure coincidence, Tarantino has a scene exactly like that with that subtext in Inglorious Bastards. However, he handles it far more gracefully. So the subtext, Hans Lander, the German officer, knows that the three Americans are pretending to be Italian. So then, this happens. Gorlami. Excuse me. Gorlami. Ancora una volta. Gorlami. E lei? Dominic de Coco. Come here. Dominic de Coco. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> this conversation is incredibly well done. It would be normal to ask someone their name, but he makes them repeat it again and again with a smile, and when he turns to the left one, who pronounces his name authentically, Lander slaps him on the back and says, well done. Now, when I first saw this scene, I thought that Lander was trying to figure out if they were allied spies or not, and I didn't notice the clues hidden in the dialogue, but in this conversation, Lander straight out confesses that he knows they are allied spies, because no person would ever applaud a man for doing his own accent correctly. On the screen, it is incredibly subtle, to the point that many viewers, even after multiple viewings, could easily miss it, but he begins to compliment one of them specifically on how well he is imitating being the Italian he is pretending to be, and if Lander thought they really were Italian, he would have never said well done, or asked them to repeat their names so many times, and let out such a grin every single time they say it. Antonio Margareti. Ancora? Margareti. Un'altra volta, ma adesso vorrei proprio sentire la musica delle parole. Margareti. That right there is a perfect example of well done subtext. A bad writer would have each and every line of dialogue surface level. Every character would say exactly what they mean to say, and nothing would be left to the imagination, but Tarantino has an abundance of subtext to many of his lines. There is often a hidden purpose or train of thought that is incredibly easy for the viewer to miss and be none the wiser to, but for a perceptive viewer, all those little nuggets of subtext make that dialogue just that little bit more witty. Just that little bit more fun to watch. But if you were to ask me, the real Tarantino style, the real area of his filmmaking where his talent truly shines, is in how Tarantino creates suspense and holds that suspense over the course of a long scene. What sounds on the surface to be quite a simple task is in practice exceptionally hard to pull off. Now, there are many examples of Tarantino creating this long form suspense, such as the story about how the general's son was murdered in The Hateful Eight, or the poisoned coffee scene from the very same movie, but I think one of his very best examples is the opening scene to Inglorious Bastards. So here is the premise. A French farmer gets a visit from the German, Colonel Lander. The reason for his visit is left a mystery for the first couple minutes when finally it is revealed. I've heard that the Führer has put you in charge of running up the Jews left in France. Why are they hiding or passing for Gentile? So for the next few minutes they have a conversation with a small uneasiness, but in the middle of that conversation the truth is finally revealed. The Jewish family he is hunting is hiding beneath the floorboards. From this moment on the dread builds like a snowball rolling down a hill. The farmer reveals that a squad of Germans already searched his house months ago, then Lander goes off on a tangent about animals and how they are, in his opinion, related to humans. If one were to determine what attribute the German people share with a beast, there would be the cunning and the predatory instinct of a hawk. But if one were to determine what attributes the Jews share with a beast, it would be that of the rat. Tarantino takes his time, going on tangents, being extra sure not to rush the next few moments. All the while, the viewer doesn't really know where Lander's analogy is going, until he finally says this. 
A German soldier conducts a search of a house suspected of hiding Jews. Where does the hawk look? He looks in the barn, he looks in the attic, he looks everywhere he would hide. But there's so many places it would never occur to a hawk to hide. The audience remembers about the German squad who searched the house and couldn't find anything, and then they make the connection. Lander is saying that the Germans did not know what they were doing, and did not check the house properly. This, by the way, is a good example of well-done subtext, and then the viewer's stomach sinks as they realise exactly what Lander is implying. And it seems very possible he suspects the Jewish family is in fact inside the house. And then after some small talk, a silence takes the room. You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Yes. You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? And then the terrible conclusion that the audience suspected might happen at the start of the scene has become a certainty. This is fantastic suspense, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned just from looking at this scene alone. Near the start of the scene, the audience is informed of the officer's mission, and the fact his targets are beneath the floorboards. As the audience has been given the information, they can piece together that the characters have the potential to collide with devastating consequence for the French farmer and the Jews hiding beneath the floor. What's interesting to note about this scene is how the tension in this scene does not stagnate. It is constantly building. And how exactly does the tension build? Well, the moment the audience learns the information about Lander's mission and the people hiding below, that possibility that they will collide with one another enters the viewer's head. As the tension in the scene builds, so does the possibility that the terrible eventuality will become reality. The scene gradually progresses from it being possible that Lander will find and kill the Jews to it being absolutely certain that that will happen. That is the source for the entirety of the suspense in this scene. And that's the thing, the serious majority of writers simply cannot create tension in the way Tarantino does because they are so very often in a rush. The characters say all their lines efficiently and purposefully so that the viewer can move on to the next scene as quickly as possible. And I will confess it's a failure in dialogue that I as a writer constantly stumble into. You cannot have a strong, long, palpable tension in a conversation when that conversation is over in less than 30 seconds. But if you do what Tarantino does, establish the goals of the two characters where they have the potential to collide with devastating conflict, and then you, over the course of a five minute conversation, peel back the layers as the audience slowly puts the pieces together, and after each and every piece is put forth on the screen, the tension only grows stronger as the viewer gradually realises that that horrible outcome they initially suspected is becoming more and more certain, until what feels like after an unbearably lengthy dread, it finally culminates in the worst possible scenario. This approach makes not just for good dialogue, but great cinema as a whole, and I think another good example of Tarantino creating suspense is later on in the same movie, where there is a British spy and an SS officer sitting at a table, and there is a long, drawn out sequence where the officer is suspicious of his German accent, and later on in that scene, the spy says, this. Drei Gläser. And then the officer makes this expression. At a first viewing, this expression means nothing, and when the shooting starts 60 seconds later, it is almost a moment of shock. Only in the next scene is it revealed the subtle manner in which he gave away the fact that he wasn't German due to his hand gestures. He ordered three glasses. We order three glasses. That's the German three. So on a second viewing, as the viewer knows the tell and the way in which the spy gives himself up, that expression the officer pulls has a totally different meaning to the first viewing, as the viewer knows that the officer has just realised that he is a spy. As Alfred Hitchcock once said, The essential fact is, to get real suspense, you must let the audience have information. Now let's take the old-fashioned bomb theory. You and I are sitting talking, we'll say, about baseball. We're talking for five minutes. Suddenly a bomb goes off and the audience have a ten second terrible shock. Now, let's take the same situation. Tell the audience at the beginning that under the table, and show it to them, there's a bomb and it's going to go off in five minutes. And we talk baseball. 
What are the audience doing? They're saying, don't talk about baseball. There's a bomb under there. Now, giving the audience the correct amount of information and turning that scene into a suspenseful one, now that's good filmmaking. But writing it in a way where on the first viewing it is a moment of shock, and on the second, it is a scene of suspense. Now that's downright genius filmmaking. But ultimately, the climax of the conflict, the moment where the argument is lost or the character is killed, that isn't the moment that is the most interesting part. But rather, the most interesting part is when the climax of that conflict is impending. It's for this reason I imagine that Tarantino could direct an exceptionally good horror film, as he is a master at building and milking that big release of tension. Tarantino is a master at storytelling, and I know a lot of you guys who watch this channel, just like me, aspire to one day make your own movies and write your own stories, which is a very admirable goal. However, it's hard. It is hard to write a good story or make a good film, especially without the proper knowledge on how to do it. Even for veterans in the field, there is always Always something more to learn. And when it comes to increasing your knowledge and honing down your craft, there is no place I would recommend more than Skillshare. And I can happily thank Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. I've been using this service for six months now and it's a resource for learning that I've personally found invaluable. Skillshare has over 19,000 courses from creative writing to graphic design to business management and everything in between. There are a lot of courses that I found useful but I think a great great place to start for you writers out there is the Writing Academy series by Steve Alcorn. In his classes he covers pretty much every topic on writing that you could think of and he's helped me learn quite a bit about character creation and dialogue so that would be a great place to get started. Premium membership begins for around $10 a month but for the first 699 people to sign up with that link in the description you will get two months of Skillshare totally for free. No catch, no cost, two months of premium membership totally for free. However, these spots are expected to go very quickly, so please, before it's too late, click that link in the description while the offer still stands. Anyway, thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.